Jimmy Neutron has certainly earned its status as a Nickelodeon classic, so it's only fitting that we examine the city of Retroville to find out which characters are the most good, which are the most evil, and which are somewhere in between. I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and this is the adventures of Jimmy Neutron, good to evil. One more step in your space toast! And just for reference, we won't be counting any characters from the Fairly Odd Parents or any characters or events from the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour crossover specials, because those are considered non canon. As usual, we'll be starting with the friendlier side of the cast and working our way down to the worst of the worst. These characters are the good, and the gold medal of good is going to Jimmy's parents, Hugh and Judy Neutron. Yeah, we're placing both of them together because it's honestly too close to call. Judy is definitely more responsible and sensible between the two. She's the embodiment of the typical 50s housewife, who's always concerned with keeping the home clean and making sure Jimmy stays out of trouble, with mixed results on both. Judy's not afraid to discipline Jimmy when he puts himself or others in danger, but she's also supportive of her genius son and loves him very much. Jimmy's gadgets have saved the town dozens of times. Hugh, on the other hand, is the typical goofy, bumbling dad but his quirkiness is very endearing and often hilarious. Hugh teaches his son important life lessons just as often as Judy does, such as that money isn't everything. Obviously, the two of them are not without their faults. Neither of them believes Jimmy when he says he didn't sabotage his gifts to the family in the episode Clash of the Cousins, and they both punish him for the sake of maintaining their image around their wealthy Aunt Amanda. Maybe be adopted! Look, yeah, he looks nothing like me! But in the end, considering the difficulty of raising the smartest kid who's ever lived, calling these two anything other than great parents would just be inaccurate. It. The silver medal of good is going to Jimmy's mechanical canine, Goddard. I know we generally tend to give the pets the top spot in our list of good, but we wanted to give the spotlight to some of the human characters this time. Still, Goddard is loyal to Jimmy and useful in almost every episode. While he may be a highly advanced robot, he also displays some pretty typical dog behavior, such as barking constantly, fighting with other dogs, and using the world as his bathroom. The complicated thing about robots is that all of their morality is down to some form of programming, and since Goddard has been programmed to remain loyal to Jimmy, his morality is highly dependent on whatever Jimmy does, but if cartoons have taught us anything, it's that all dogs are inherently good unless they're demons or Brian Griffin. Goddard is a good boy who deserves second place. Defensive plan Delta. <laughs> and taking the bronze medal of good is Jimmy's llama-loving best friend, Carl Weezer. Carl is passive and is often pressured into participating in Jimmy's schemes, despite his safety concerns. He's a fairly typical, hefty, dorky, overly anxious kid with a ridiculous amount of allergies and bodily issues. But that doesn't stop him from going on adventures, sometimes against his will. Do I have something on my lip? He hates to see his friends fighting, and it's often during these times when he decides to speak up and try to get them to stop. It's shown in the episodes I Dream of Jimmy and Carl Weezer, Boy Genius, that Carl is deeply envious of everything Jimmy has, from his intelligence to his personality and even his parents. It's kind of messed up to want to replace your best friend, but it's not like he really acts on it. In fact, Carl is often the only one to stick by Jimmy's side, even when the whole class and or town turns on him. I wouldn't say that Carl is too pure for this world, but he is loyal to his friends, and he usually doesn't cause trouble. Not intentionally, anyway. I hope it's soon. I need to use the little boy's ocean. Fame's secret agent, Jet Fusion, is up next. Usually, if you're famous for being a secret agent, you're probably doing it wrong. But most people only know Jet Fusion from his action movies. He's not the most humble of spies, as we see in his first interaction with Jimmy, but honestly, most of us would have the same reaction if our only rescue team was an 11 year old kid. They sent a punk kid to save the greatest secret agent ever? Jimmy earns Jet's respect, and the two of them go on to defeat Beautiful Gorgeous and Professor Calamitous and escape down the side of a collapsing Mount Everest. In his next appearance, we see that Jet is a bit too love struck for his own good. After serving just two weeks in prison, Beautiful Gorgeous is released and finds Jet to supposedly confess her love for him. Jet, for some reason, is not skeptical of this in the slightest and proposes to her almost immediately, which allows Beautiful to hypnotize him as part of her scheme to eliminate both Jet and Jimmy. Fortunately, 
Through the power of gospel music, the hypnosis is broken and the wedding is called off, but Jet can't get over Gorgeous and promises to wait for her to get out of prison again. Write me every day! I'll wait for you, baby! Sure, he's a bit too love-struck for his own good, but he's the world's greatest super spy. I'm sure he's put away more evil mistresses than he's tried to marry. Next up is one of Jimmy's most annoying inventions, Brobot. Jimmy decides he wants a little brother to play with, but since that's not really an option for Hugh and Judy, Jimmy decides to build one in his lab. Jimmy apparently never programmed Brobot with the sleep function, as he never runs out of battery or has to recharge which means he has all day and all night to play all sorts of games. I jumped over the big white round thing in the sky! Jimmy becomes annoyed with Brobot. After it turns out, he's more well-liked and better than Jimmy at pretty much everything. But rather than deactivating him, Jimmy decides to send him to the moon to live with his own parents, Mombot and Popbot. So we don't see Brobot again until season two, when he sends out a fake distress call from the moon to get Jimmy to come visit him since Jimmy has basically ignored him for the entire time he's been there. Jimmy, Carl, and Sheen dismiss Brobot after he tells them that he actually has an emergency, which is that his parents have been kidnapped by the Junkman, and the three of them leave to go back to Earth. But as it turns out, Junkman is real, and he pulls Jimmy's rocket into a ship and captures the three boys. They defeat the Junkman, but they're unable to pilot his ship after he sends it crashing into the moon and leaves in the escape pod. All hope seems lost, but Brobot uses his own head as the steering wheel and saves the day for the three boys and his parents. Brobot can't help his annoying tendencies since he's just following his programming, as he reminds Jimmy. But even though he's kind of a pain, what little brother isn't? He's a good kid who has actually saved lives, so we think he's earned his spot this high up. Moving on, we have Principal Willoughby. It's rare to have a cartoon principal who's both good at his job and cares about the well-being of his students, but Willoughby succeeds more at the latter than the former. Nine times out of ten, he's positive and encouraging to all the students at Lindbergh Elementary, and the other one time is usually him being passive-aggressive for the purpose of a joke. The principal is also about as naive and clueless as they come. Like when he believes Sheen when he says that the kids are going to the school's tanning salon, when in reality, they're sneaking out of school to go to the beach. Wait a minute. Come on. We don't have a tanning salon. Willoughby never puts people in danger and is never malicious, with the notable exception of anything involving the school's theater productions. But again, that's just an exception to his otherwise optimistic personality. We gotta give a quick mention to Bulby Stroganovsky. Hello, fellow learners! Call me Bulby! He's a foreign exchange student from the country of Bakharistan and is considered one of the stranger kids at Lindbergh Elementary, which says a lot when he's competing with kids like Carl and Sheen. Besides his weirdness, we don't know a whole lot about Bulby's personality, but at least he has integrity. He's the only candidate who doesn't try to rig the school election, and so he wins by default. That's enough to earn him a spot in the good tier. Lights but a walking shadow. Next up is Cindy's best friend, Libby Fulfax. One might think as the best friend to Jimmy's biggest rival, Libby would be just as mean and spiteful as Cindy, but she seems more concerned with jamming out to her CDs than picking on Neutron. In fact, she's pretty nice to Jimmy and his friends, at least in the later seasons, which makes sense as it's later revealed that she's in love with Sheen. She's also honest, and it's normally out of character for her to lie about anything such as when she lies to Cindy about where her gym stash is, while the whole group is suffering from Ruby Madness. Ruby Madness. Be quiet! There is that dark timeline where she becomes the evil dictator of Retroville, but that only happens because Carl exposes her to the megalomanium at her birthday party. Still, it seems like most of the time, any bit of power she has almost immediately goes to her head such as when she starts gossiping about everyone's private lives when she's given her own news segment. Call me when you get some real dirt! While she's far from perfect, Libby is probably the closest thing the show has to a normal character, which is far from a bad thing, as she makes for a good straight woman to the others. Now it's time to talk about the boy genius, Jimmy Neutron. Those two words are pretty good descriptors of his character. He's a super genius with an IQ of 210, but he's still just a kid who hasn't learned that with great power comes great responsibility. 
Jimmy often gets in over his gigantic head when conducting experiments, such as time traveling or communicating with alien empires, which often causes trouble for the town of Retroville. Fine, you got your revenge, now leave us alone. He doesn't put much thought into his inventions and even tries to mess with things that really should be left alone, like people's personalities or even the forces of life and death. Most episodes where Jimmy rescues the city stem from problems that he creates and then fixes once he realizes the outcomes. These include plunging Retroville into an ice age, turning Miss Fowl into a giant plant monster, or unleashing an evil version of himself onto the world. All these mistakes don't really paint him in a heroic light, but what does earn him some points is his willingness to stand up to evildoers like Professor Calamitous, King Goobot V, and even his own baby cousin, Eddie. Jimmy is brave and never backs down from a fight, and I think saving the entire human race a few times makes up for his carelessness. Speaking of which, there are times when Jimmy is the only person in Retroville to realize that something is up, and it's up to him to put a stop to it because everyone else is too oblivious to their own obvious impending doom. Overall, while Jimmy has a lot of the typical flaws of an 11-year-old, like laziness, vanity, and recklessness, he is an extraordinary kid who not only wants to help people, but is willing to save the world in order to do it. Up next, we have the Ultra Lord obsessed Sheen Estevez. And no, we're not counting his appearance in Planet Sheen, or any of the characters from that show, because Nickelodeon has done everything in their power to decanonize and bury that show as the mistake that it was. Anyway, he has a bombastic and hyperactive personality, which probably stems from the amount of TV and sugar he consumes on a daily basis. Despite having a much larger brain than Carl, Sheen is easily the most dim-witted character in the show, which doesn't necessarily connect to his morality, but it does mean that he gets himself into trouble. Learn to ride them and put on a rat rodeo! We'll make millions! Most of his personality comes from his love for the superhero known as Ultra Lord, and if nothing else, he at least picked a good role model to emulate, even though he doesn't always stick to those principles of bravery and justice that the TV show espouses. Sheen also loves his dad and his girlfriend Libby even more than he loves Ultra Lord, so I'd say he's far from being a bad kid. And finishing off the good characters is Betty Quinlan. She's considered one of the popular girls at school, and she's the first girl Jimmy would actually admit that he has a crush on. As expected, the preteen kid goes a bit girl crazy and starts doing everything he can to try and impress her, including throwing a party when his parents aren't home, auditioning for the school play, and putting on a magic show. Cindy also gets jealous whenever she sees Jimmy and Betty flirting, and this tends to cause even more trouble. Generally, Betty acts very sweet and kind to Jimmy and everyone else, and it seems as though she likes him back, given that she kisses him twice. But one time, she pulls Cindy aside after a massive argument and tells her that Jimmy is all Cindy's, so long as she drops the attitude with Betty. I don't want to say that she led Jimmy on, because they are just middle school kids, but if they were old enough to know better, her behavior in that regard might count against her a bit more. Still, she is a kind and caring person, but doesn't get much spotlight other than when the show needs Jimmy to impress her and make a fool of himself while doing so. I can still give you a kiss for saving our lives. With the good characters out of the way, it's time to venture down into the ethically questionable and morally neutral characters. This is the gray area. Our first neutral character is the bird-like teacher, Miss Fowl. <laughs> Please. She states that teaching is the only thing keeping her alive and that she misses all of her students, except Sheen, when they all spontaneously become sick, so at least she's good in that regard. Other than that, she really doesn't have any more of a personality. We don't really get to see her doing anything good, and anytime she does anything bad, it's usually because of something Jimmy did earlier in the episode, like when she reverts to her primal instincts and lets the class sacrifice Jimmy. Take boy to glacier! Miss Fowl is far from bad, but we don't see her doing a lot of good either, so she earns a spot in the higher tier gray area. Next up is the show's anti-hero, Cindy Vortex. Cindy has some character flaws that, a lot of the time, 
mirror Jimmy's faults. She's arrogant, vain, overly competitive, and quick-tempered. Yeah, right. Let's have a party in this beautiful spot. Having a rivalry with Jimmy isn't necessarily bad, but she's almost always the instigator in their fights, most of the time out of pride and jealousy of the fact that Jimmy is smarter than her. But as will be obvious to most viewers, Cindy does have a huge crush on Jimmy, despite both of them vowing to hate the opposite gender. We also know that Cindy is a super genius as well, and during the show, she usually points out how dangerous and irresponsible Jimmy's inventions are, though she rarely tries to actually help him improve and would rather tease him about his failures. As previously mentioned, she gets very jealous of other girls talking to Jimmy, especially Betty Quinlan, culminating in trying to sabotage Jimmy magic act and gets the whole group stuck in a different dimension. We'll admit that she definitely got better about her arrogance and cruelty, but the amount of trouble she's caused due to arrogance and trying to sabotage Jimmy really dragged her down the list. I'm telling you, you can see the equator in the Pacific Ocean! Nick Dean is up next. Nick is seen as the coolest kid in school, and of course, he thinks that gives him a license to do whatever he wants. Miss Fowl doesn't even make him do the homework because Nick is just too cool for school though he's had to repeat the fourth grade multiple times because he's late to class every day. Nick's the guy that every girl wants and every guy wants to be, but in terms of morality, you might want to steer clear. Normally, a character of this type wouldn't want to even be seen talking to nerds like Jimmy, Carl, and Sheen, but he does offer some advice to them from time to time, like when he convinces them to sneak out and go to the opening night of Retroland. I mean, what your parents don't know won't hurt them. Unfortunately, this advice always ends up getting Jimmy and Co. into trouble, making Nick a very bad influence on the other kids. His ego is one of the worst in the show, and even though most of the time things seem to work out for him, there are those odd moments where he shows his true colors, like when he runs away screaming from Poultra the giant chicken. But we won't fault Nick too much since he's just a kid, but he's gonna have to shape up soon, or he'll probably end up working at the candy bar for the rest of his life. Or he'll be a movie star? I don't know, who knows. We gotta quickly mention the school bully, Butch Bukowski. There isn't a whole lot to say about this kid. He's the standard dumb bully. He plays baseball, likes to deal out wedgies, big words hurt his brain. However, even Butch fears the awesome power of the hall monitor. I have my pass right here. <laughs> nice to see you. Ciao. Rounding out the gray area are three villains who ended up switching sides, the Space Bandits, Zix, Travoltron, and T. When they first appear, they try to kill Jimmy and his friends and steal all the astronauts rubies that they've mined. It's a shame they'll have to be vaporized. After an intense space chase, the bandits crash into each other, leaving them stranded without any transportation. That is, until Jimmy sends the McSpanky's restaurant flying towards the sun, basically handing them a brand new spaceship. In the next appearance, they invade Earth, while Jimmy has shrunk everyone in Retroville. This allows the bandits to easily capture everyone in town, with plans to sell them to alien children as toys. Jimmy puts a stop to this plan. We don't see the bandits again until the series finale. They join the other villains in the plot to destroy Jimmy Neutron, but T isn't exactly happy with this treatment from the other baddies. Sheen manages to befriend T while in the holding cell and convinces him to go along with their escape plan. Eventually, T confronts Travoltron and Zix and asks them why exactly they have to be villains. The two can't come up with an answer, so that basically forces them to become good guys. You can't answer me, can you, Jump? Now get out there and help Jimmy! The bandits save Jimmy and his friends from T Rex and decide that it feels good to be good. So, all in all, while we haven't exactly forgotten about all the theft, kidnapping, assault, and attempted murder, at least we know that they're turning over a new leaf from now on. I think that's enough to land them just out of the bad territory. That concludes our gray area, and now it's time to descend into the hive of villainy with the bad and the evil characters. We'll mostly be focusing on the main bad guys who appear in the League of Villains, but we do have a couple of notable lesser baddies on the list. First up is Eustace Stritch. He's the usual mega-spoiled rich kid who thinks the world revolves around him because he has money. We're considering him the least bad villain for a few reasons. I warned you not to interfere, father! Now you'll pay! Normally, we'd give him the excuse that he picked up the snobbish behavior from his parents, but even his own father realizes how horrible Eustace is and has to learn to discipline his son for acting up. He became Jimmy's sworn enemy after trying to win Goddard in a wager and losing the robot battle. 
Then he tries to beat Jimmy and friends to the unlimited energy source radiating from Mars so that he can become the ruler of the Red Planet. Unfortunately for him, Mars already has an established government and they aren't too fond of humans. After briefly wooing Cindy over to his side, again, Eustace betrays her, steals Jimmy's map, and makes his way to the power source with Jimmy hot on his tail. Both of them attempt to drain the power at the same time, which awakens the local Martians who don't take too kindly to trespassers. Martians? Cool! Can I get an autograph? The aliens prepare to fire a Death Star beam right into the Earth, forcing Jimmy and Eustace to team up to defeat them. Thankfully, they do, and the entire group returns to Earth together. Seems like Eustace may actually get some redemption, but nope, he's right back to being a bad guy in the series finale. Aside from being an all-around irritating snob, he's also physically abusive towards his butler, Blix, who must get paid real well to deal with it. Nobody beats me! Nobody, 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 nobody! Still, saving the Earth from destruction counts for something, especially when a lot of his fellow villains have the opposite goal in mind. Next up, we have Nanobots N1 and N2 respectively. Of all of Jimmy's most dangerous inventions, these two neurotic little bots are possibly the most destructive. What? Your chair is bigger than mine. Jimmy invents them to protect him from bullies at school, but the bots are unable to distinguish between bullying threats and just normal, everyday actions. So the bots start attacking everyone, until Jimmy outsmarts them by attacking himself, overloading their programming and causing them to explode. Down the line, he tries again, where instead of counteracting bullying, their task is to help him write better poetry. Specifically, they're supposed to correct the error, and of course, they take this to the biggest extreme possible and begin correcting for every error in existence. Jimmy makes matters worse by telling them that flaws are part of human nature, which the bots believe is an extreme error that needs to be deleted. They then move to delete everyone on Earth and save Jimmy for last so that they can please the creator. We must delete every human on Earth. After the entire population, except for Jimmy and his dad, has been de-atomized, Jimmy manages to outsmart the nanobots by having them compute the infinite value of pi, which causes them to overload yet again. The nanobots want to do everything in their power to please Jimmy, even after they've been locked up like Hannibal Lecter. They are somewhat free-thinking, but like with all robots in the show, they are slaves to their programming. The nanobots aren't evil so much as they are misguided, so I think it's fair to say that the danger comes from Jimmy's lack of forethought and really from any sort of malice that the bots may have. Moving on, we have Grandma Taters. She appears as the host of The Happy Show Show, a seemingly inane and innocent TV show where she spends the whole time singing about being happy. However, Jimmy starts noticing the people of Retroville acting very strange, only ever talking about the show and about how happy they would be if Jimmy watched it. After Betty Quinlan offers to have Jimmy come over to watch the show with her, he finally discovers what's going on. Grandma Taters has been using her TV show to hypnotize people into mindless, ultra-happy zombies. You will do whatever I say. What's worse is that she's put all of Retroville in a trance and will soon broadcast her show across the entire world if Jimmy can't stop her. He enlists the help of Cindy, who was at a karate tournament and didn't have a chance to be hypnotized, and the two of them have to locate the source of the broadcast while avoiding their brainwashed friends and family. The two of them discover Grandma Tater's studio and eventually take her down before she can hypnotize anyone else and Jimmy is also able to undo the brainwashing of Retroville. The strange thing about it is that she actually might have good intentions. Jimmy and Cindy set her free after breaking her spell, and she leaves of her own volition, stating that she just wanted everyone to be happy. I just wanted everyone to be happy. A flying saucer then appears, with several Grandma Taters lookalikes inside, and she reveals herself as an evil alien, vowing to return one day to presumably hypnotize the Earth. We'll be back. In her other appearance, she threatens to eat baby Eddie. Because of the whole mind control thing, I would still err on the side of caution and say that this granny is undoubtedly evil. Next on the list is the show's greediest villain, the Junk Man. He kidnaps Brobot's parents from the moon and tries to scrap them and sell them as alien frisbees. 
He also sold his own mother to the highest bidder, and he was also willing to sell his dog Roxy, but thought that the offer was too low. My price stands at 100 settlers. He lends his ship to the League of Villains and participates in the plot to destroy Jimmy, but he's upset at having to work with Beautiful Gorgeous. No act is too cruel for the junk man, theft, kidnapping, attempted murder, so long as there's money involved. But thankfully, he's defeated by the power of love, Love Potion 976J to be specific. Just before he's about to crush Jimmy and his friends with a giant boulder, he and Gorgeous both inhale the potion and fall in love, taking both of them out of the fight and leaving every villain stuck in Earth's Cretaceous period. You're spoiled, obnoxious, and all mine! Jimmy's dastardly clone, Evil Jimmy is next. Evil Jimmy is exactly how he sounds, a malevolent version of our boy genius. He embodies Jimmy's desire to make trouble and control other people, as shown when he pretends to be the real Jimmy and goes on a hypnotizing spree across Retroville. Drop and give me 400,000! Sir, yes, sir! He eventually goes on to clone everyone on Earth to create an entirely evil version of humanity. The worst part about this is that evil Earth is feeding off of the matter of good Earth and will eventually make the other planet fade into oblivion if Jimmy can't stop him. Thankfully, Jimmy's able to infiltrate the evil Earth and stop the cloning process before the real Earth dissolves. But evil Jimmy has one last trick up his sleeve. He breaks the dark matter power chip, which begins to suck the entire evil planet into the dark matter dimension. Luckily, Jimmy escapes before he's trapped with all the evil clones and restores Earth to its full power, though the episode ends with a threat from evil Jimmy that he'll return. Be back! <laughs> Unfortunately, the show was cancelled before his planned return, so that threat remains empty. Regardless, Evil Jimmy is still a troublemaker and a tyrant who planned to destroy Earth to replace it with another, so he's earned his spot among the evil characters. Next up is the youngest Neutron, Baby Eddie. Okay, we're gonna throw out the he's just a kid argument with this one. Like Jimmy, Eddie is a super genius with intelligence far beyond his years. Far beyond the years of most people, for that matter. I never guessed that a baby could be as smart as you! Unlike Jimmy, however, Eddie is malicious, sadistic, and heartless. He tries to frame Jimmy for attacking everyone at the Neutron family reunion, tries to suffocate Jimmy, Sheen, Carl, and Cousin Gomer to death, and attempts to murder his entire family by placing a bomb into the cake, all so that he can eliminate the competitors for Aunt Amanda's inheritance. I mean, uh... Goodness, that's... That's uh, pretty dark for a show like this. Anyway, Jimmy stops Eddie's plan and exposes him as an evil genius to the whole family, and we're left to assume that he's going to be put in some kind of facility until he shapes up. But somehow, we see him out and about riding a damn motorcycle when he receives King Goobot's invitation. Eddie joins up with the other bad guys and works with Grandma Taters to incapacitate Goddard to prepare for the attack on Jimmy. We'll give him one thing, though. Like, Eddie's at least fearless enough to face down a T-Rex and chase it with a five-day-old dirty diaper, but he's still evil to the core and worthy of the fifth place spot on our list. In fourth place is the femme fatale, Beautiful Gorgeous. At first, she shoots Jimmy, Sheen, and Carl out of the sky over the Pacific Ocean. Are you boys all right? Will you be my mommy? They don't initially know that it was her who fired the missile, which gives her an advantage as she tries to gain some intelligence from them. They quickly admit to her that they're on a secret mission to rescue a captive spy, and then, having all she needs from them, she moves to execute these three elementary school children and dump their bodies into the sea. Jimmy manages to outsmart her, and the three escape, but Gorgeous fires a torpedo from her boat at Jimmy's hover car, with the boys just narrowly avoiding being struck by it. She shows up again at the secret mountain base of Professor Calamitous, after Jimmy has been discovered and captured while trying to rescue Jet. It's here where she reveals that she never wanted to be evil, but she carries out her orders because Calamitous raised her that way. You have issues with your father, don't you? He always wanted me to be a villainous. Aside from the whole executing a bunch of kids thing, this also counts against her in a serious way. She knows what she's doing is wrong, and she doesn't really like her father, and yet she still chooses to do evil even though she knows that there are other options. Although I will say, seeing them bicker while the mountain is about to be blown to pieces is pretty hilarious. After them. 
Gorgeous, along with the rest of the villains, probably ended up perishing in the Cretaceous period in the show's timeline, but we'll never know for sure since we never got that fourth season. At least she's there with her one true love, the Junkman. Taking the bronze medal of evil is the show's main villain, Professor Finbar Calamitous. He appears to be rather harmless, barring the giant robot suit, when we first meet him because he's never been able to finish anything, even his own sentences. They called me half done and never finish. As such, his evil intentions had never been fully functional. So, after coming out of hiding, he lures Jimmy Neutron to his lab to force him to finish every invention that the professor has been unable to complete by himself. Jimmy escapes from captivity and tries to make a run for it, but he's unable to shake Calamitous off his tail until the professor lets it slip that he really has to use the bathroom. Jimmy is able to use the mad scientist's own bladder against him, causing the professor to retreat for the time being. Wait a minute, if he's a professor, how did he finish college? And what is he a professor of? Uh, uh, anyway, we, we don't see him again until Operation Rescue Jet Fusion, where he stars as the main villain alongside his daughter. It's here where we see his most sinister plan of the whole show. He wants to melt all the ice from Mount Everest to flood the entire world in order for all of humanity to notice his achievements. Well, the only problem being that no one can notice him if everyone is freaking dead to dead dead dead. Now, now, let's not bicker in front of the guests. To be fair, he does admit that he didn't think the plan entirely through, another proof of him never being able to finish what he starts. Thanks to the combined efforts of Jimmy and Jet Fusion, he and his daughter are defeated, and the world is saved. Speaking of which, he corrupted his daughter and turned her into his evil minion, even though both of them are about the same level of incompetent. Calamitous doesn't do a whole lot in the League of Villains, but I think his plan to drown the entire Earth for the sake of recognition is evil enough. Add him to the list of villains with planet-destroying tendencies. Speaking of which, the Silver Medal of Evil goes to King Gubat V in the Yolkian Empire. Gubat, his brother Ublar, and the rest of the Yolkians are egg-shaped, goopy aliens that worship the chicken goddess Poltra. After receiving a deep space transmission from Jimmy Neutron, Gubat orders his fleet to head for Earth and abduct all the adults to be given as a sacrifice to Poltra. Realizing that their parents are gone, the children of Retroville take over and throw a massive city-wide party. But after a day, they realize that they miss their parents and have no idea how to actually take care of themselves. Luckily, Jimmy discovers that the Yolkians have abducted the adults, and he, along with Nick, Cindy, and the other kids, devise a plan to get their parents back. When they arrive on planet Yolkis, they are captured by the local guards and brought before the king. Hello, itty bitty humans. Gubat explains that the adults will be fed to Poltra as part of their human sacrifice ritual, now featuring actual humans, all while humiliating Jimmy and turning all of the other kids against him. Jimmy and the other kids are able to rescue their parents and escape Poltra, but Gubat gives chase with the Yolkian fleet at his side. The kids manage to destroy every ship except for Gubat's ship, but Jimmy's able to blow that one away, literally. When the Yolkians return, they bring the fight to Earth, except there's no fight at all, but a peace offering to all the humans. We come in peace. Gubat and Ublar explain that they never wanted to be evil, but Poltra made them do everything from the previous movie. The whole town initially suspects that something's up, but after Gubat bribes them all with gifts, they drop their suspicions. They even start to turn on Jimmy, who doesn't believe their facade, which is bizarre since every single person in that town almost got eaten thanks to the Yolkians, and Jimmy was the one who saved them. Everyone in Retroville is an idiot. Cindy is slightly suspicious of the Yolkians as well, but after Goobot manipulates her and plays on her jealousy of Jimmy, she helps them to access his lab so they can steal some of his DNA replicating technology. Unsurprisingly, the Yolkians have actually infiltrated the town and plan to clone Poltra to have another go at the human sacrifice ritual, since the real Poltra abandoned them after their failure in the first movie, all just to get back at Jimmy Neutron for defeating them. It seemed like just yesterday she abandoned us out of shame. I'm willing to bet if they're willing to feed one town of humans to a giant chicken that they won't stop there. Goobot hates Jimmy so much that he tries to assemble a team of the galaxy's most dastardly villains in order to take him out. 
I see no reason why the Yolkians wouldn't try to wipe out the human race, but it's like I always say, the only thing worse than destroying one planet is destroying several. I'll get you someday, Jimmy Neutron! And we gotta give the gold medal of evil to Meldar Prime. There's nothing more despicable than a sleazy game show host, especially one that likes to blow up the home worlds of the people who participate and lose. His show, Intergalactic Showdown, has apparently been going on for centuries, since Earth has been receiving his invitations since the dawn of civilization. But it's not until the age of Jimmy Neutron that the humans are finally able to respond. The regular crew, plus Bulby, are transported to the stage, where Meldar explains that they either compete against three other alien races or the Earth will be destroyed. The loser gets their home planet destroyed! All the while, he does everything he can to tear the human team apart, including allowing other races to cheat to try and sabotage Earth's chances of winning. For whatever reason, it seems like Meldar really has it out for Earth. I suppose it wasn't enough to just have the safety of the entire planet on the line, we gotta have a host with a vendetta too. Regardless, the humans end up making a terrific comeback and win the game, but Jimmy refuses to let the other planets be destroyed, and decides to put an end to the show once and for all. After an epic battle with Meldar and his team of robots, Jimmy takes control of his power source and threatens to blow up the entire quadrant if Meldar doesn't step down and let someone else take control. Honestly, for someone who's blown up hundreds if not thousands of planets and exterminated entire populations of alien species, he gets off pretty easy, starring in infomercials for incredibly painful products. But to us, he's the worst of the worst, and worthy of the title Most Evil Scumbag in the Galaxy. Alright guys, it's your turn. Let us know in the comments if you agree with our ranking, and tell us which series you'd like to see next. Be sure to hit that notification bell so you don't miss new episodes of Good to Evil featuring your favorite movies, TV shows, and video games. And as always, stay wicked.